Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. We're always talking about the Beatles here on my channel, whether it be their years together, their solo years. Uh, sometimes it'll be about new releases or what's going on in the news. One guest that I've had on frequently, and he's such a pleasure to bring on, is Luca Parassi. You know him for this particular book, for which we've discussed quite a lot of the contents in here. We still have a little bit more to go. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, I've been promising folks we're going to talk about Flowers in the Dirt very soon. And also all the music in between Press to Play and Flowers in the Dirt, the Phil Ramone sessions in particular, the, the Russian album. We'll get to that soon. I promise. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's something a bit more immediate because Luke is such a busy guy. He has put out another book on Paul. Paul McCartney and, and Wings, Ben on the Run, the story of a classic album. So we welcome back Luca to Ken Michaels Radio. Well, thanks, Ken. Uh, it's uh, it's always a pleasure. So we got a new book uh, to discuss together, and so well, let's dive in. And I'm happy to to share details uh, about it uh, uh, with you and your audience. I know uh, the last time that we we did our interview, you were talking about wanting to do the follow-up to music as ideas but you wanted to wait until paul's new album comes out so i guess this is in the meantime something to keep you busy and i also understand you have you have intentions of writing books for all of paul's albums am i correct it's it's an ambitious plan but uh it's uh it's a very possible uh i mean the next one for sure will be on ram and um, as they say, if I'm lucky, <laughs> it will be out before the end of the year uh, because I, I started I started uh, writing it as the first book on this new series, Milestones, uh, because it's my favorite McCartney album, Ram. And so I started with this idea. Then I thought, well, it's, it's 50 years uh, from you know band on the run 50th anniversary so i, I didn't know about any uh, initiative um from paul's camp but i was sure they they would not miss this anniversary and so i, I did the same mm -hmm. and uh put together this one and said well okay let's start this series with band on the run which is not a bad album with with which starting a series of classic albums and um, yeah, so this is the first in a, in, in a series. There would be um, other books on, by me and by other authors on, on other artists as well. Mm. Uh, but since my, my main field is uh, Paul, uh, I would dive in uh, uh, many albums. Uh, next one will be Ram. Maybe next will be Back to the Egg. Uh, who knows? I'll keep you posted. Okay. Well, you know, Paul started his archival series with Ben on the Run. So you're yeah. kind of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a coincidence. I mean, I have linked this to to the anniversary, to the fact that uh, uh, I had um, interest in material uh, to to share. And I do, I, I, I thought it was good to to have a fresh uh, kind of book sp on a specific album which is not very common mm. and i think it's the first uh, uh dedicated to a single album on by paul mccartney and um yeah uh, uh so yeah it's a it's a good reading i wanted something maybe more engaging but at the same time uh, based on on historical facts and presenting something new, something not well known, along with uh, the stories that we already know since way back, but in a in a in a kind of a different approach. Uh, with uh, you know, there are color images in the book, you know. So it's I think it's a it's a fun reading. I had fun uh, putting it together, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for new information about specifically the songs. And uh, we're very fortunate that we're living in a time when there's a lot of amazing 
material coming out, whether it's Mark Lewison's work, Ken Womack's work, uh, you know, um, Alan yeah. Rosen and Adrian Sinclair and, and all of that. And sure. now all the stuff that you put in Music is Ideas, which is a great, great reference book. I can't say enough about this. I had to use Thank it in my last interview. <laughs> uh-huh. I thought that we would start by talking a little about the period leading up to Ben on the Run and the first lineup of Wings. And early on in your book, at the very beginning, it does say that Wings had developed the following of young fans that didn't even know that Paul was a Beatle. And mm-hmm. I know from talking to Denny Sywell, he certainly confirmed that, that he came across some fans that knew the individual members of Wings and their names and they had an identity. So I found that to be a pretty interesting way to kind of start the book. Yeah, I, I think, well, you know, let's, uh, well, I'm, I, I was born in 1969. So basically, well, I missed the Beatles <laughs> and I'm, I missed Wings as well because, you know, when I was, 10 wings kind of disbanded and stuff so my first memories of of paul was a solo artist you mm-hmm. know uh, maybe i got some memories about good night tonight but in my case when i discovered paul's music well i knew he was in the beatles but i didn't know anything about wings anything maybe. never never heard about about wings Oh, well, okay. So at the time of uh, Red Rose Speedway and uh, uh, the spring of 1973, I think if you are, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 years old and you're a young boy and, you know, McCarthy has a new band and you have started, uh, you know, buying your records, uh, uh, maybe with your first money or asking your parents to buy your, your, your records. Mm. Then at the time, Wings were, well, all over the place. So they got a couple of singles already in the charts and stuff. So I think it, it's it's quite natural to say, okay, okay, there was a business before. Yeah, but I'm here for Wings. And that's what these young fans basically told. And it's it's an interesting perspective because uh, even now, you know, we all know about Wings. We all know that Paul had 55 years of career after the Beatles and the Beatles are still very, very big. Mm -hmm. And, and we had another proof with now and then last year, you know, I think the single sold uh, in physical terms, very well. I, if I'm not wrong, could be it could be around one million copies or something like that all over the world, which these days it's it's an incredible achievement, uh, and there's emotion tied to to the Beatles as well still today. So yeah, it was interesting to to start with uh, uh, Wings as a new band, as a new path for McCartney that was getting bigger and had a specific audience, which was there for them and to, to you know, to, to take part in a concert with Wings songs and not uh, even thinking about uh, the old classics of the Beatles. Yeah. In a way, it's kind of remarkable with any artist and it's even more extraordinary with any of the Beatles to find an entirely new audience. I know that there was definitely carryover from the Beatle years of Beatle fans buying Paul McCartney's music. But when your music is being played on hit radio stations, where you've got little kids listening all the way up to, to grownups, you're going to have young people out there that had no idea that Paul McCartney was in the Beatles, despite the yeah. fact that I know that that's hard for some people to believe. But it's the same thing. I remember um, one of my shows, somebody was commenting about this and saying that he got into uh, Phil Collins music without knowing Phil Collins was in Genesis. While they both had careers at the same time in a band yeah. with Phil as a solo artist, it can happen. It, I know it's well, hard to believe, but... 
Yeah, but uh, yeah, it is another example uh, for for me again. Um, when I discovered Peter Gabriel, uh, mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't know at all that it was in Genesis before. So. Right. I knew Genesis because of Phil Collins and stuff. It, they, they were very popular in the, in the mid uh, '80s, and at the same time, I discovered Peter Gabriel, and uh, I had to go back and to read something to discover it because I didn't know it. <laughs> mm. So it's an interesting process, learning process, you know. <laughs> but it's 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 a it's an amazing thing, you know, to have an afterlife and a second life. Yeah. And in some cases, with the solo Beatles, a third life, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you know, Paul had a career with classical music, and George had a career with handmade films, and it's you know, traveling Wilburys too. So there's all these paths and all these new adventures that they went into. And when you've got someone like Paul here in the '70s, and he got massive airplay with Wings, there was a new audience of people that didn't know his past identity. And Denny Sirell mm-hmm. said in your book that Wings were considered, a, at least to him, a hot live band early on. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we have to, to remember that, uh, you know, Red Rose Speedway came out uh, in, in the spring. And I think it was uh, number one at, in the U.S. for something like at least four consecutive weeks, Billboard charts, Wait. which is four or five i can't remember anyway it's well it's a nice you know string of uh uh being a number one for four four weeks it's uh it's very it's very good they had mile over number one then they got live and let die which was a million seller Mm -hmm. so yeah basically they were they were very high in the charts so if you were a fan it was uh it was a very nice moment to be a fan, you know. Sure. And even before that, you still had high, yeah. high making the top 10 in, yeah. in the U.S. anyway. And uh, yeah, and Paul had the earlier hits with Another Day and Uncle Albert, but those weren't really Wings recordings. Um, you do mention that the City Hall concert in Newcastle was recorded for a possible live album. Yeah, there was an acetate was uh, was produced and uh, probably they were thinking about something, uh, which we all know because it, it went out as a bootleg sure. many years ago. And it's a very good recording. I mean, I enjoyed it very much as a recording. I mean, it's uh, Paul is in top form to my ears vocally. And I think the band is tight and, and uh, you can definitely hear they have improved uh, compared to um, what I've what I've heard from the previous Wings of a Europe tour, there mm-hmm. there were a couple of nice uh, recordings from the summer uh, of nineteen seventy two, but I think the Newcastle concert uh, it's great, it's a great recording, it's a great performance. You know, we're dealing at a time when Paul. And most artists put out an album a year. And yeah. in 73, Paul, with Wings, released Red Rose Speedway and Ben on the Run, and mm-hmm. Die in the Middle. I guess there was no chance for a live album to be sandwiched. No. Was it really just, it was just recorded for posterity? Or was it really, was there strong consideration for a live album? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh when when you put as you said two studio albums out then after the success of band on the run without uh without Danny Sywell and Aaron McAuliffe yeah. because they went out then the 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 live album with the two members in could have been strange so i think it was dusted quite yeah. quickly well after band on the run certainly it wouldn't have made much sense i guess but um, yeah, was the band really upset when Red Rose Speedway was cut down to a single album? Because the original intention was for it to. Hmm. Well, obviously, uh, if you if you listen to Red Rose Speedway as a double album, hmm. and if you listen to Red Rose Speedway in its final form, they are two completely different albums. 
uh, in fact, uh, the double was more censored than wings, and yep. the single is is Paul, is basically Paul. You know, there are even two songs from from Ram that they they completed, they refined it. But if I had to tell you Red Rose Speedway, which I love, I love Red Rose Speedway as a single album. I don't have complaints about it. Uh, but it's to me, it's mainly Paul. It's very melodic. It's very centered on a piano based song. Let's think about, uh, you know, that's my love. Although Paul is playing an electric piano, not a classic grand piano. A single pigeon is a, is a piano ballad. When, uh, when the night has got a piano. Well, uh, also the, the, the final medley, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's Paul. And the double, the double uh, got some more uh, rock numbers in. Uh, I, I know this could be an unpopular, unpopular opinion, but I'm not really sure if uh, the Red Rose Speedway as a double album uh, could be really successful as a single album was. That's my my feeling. That's my that's my feeling after many years. Uh, the truth is that we 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 will never know. Uh, and the truth is that the album was cut down to a single and it was a success. So whoever decided it, he was right, mm. we can say. Well, and we don't have counterproof for for the uh, double version. Uh, to me, it sounds interesting. Maybe it's a little bit uh, too much experimental. I don't know at the time uh, which kind of... Uh, uh, audience or which kind of reception mainly uh, by the critics could have could have uh, been I, I'm not sure because at the time we know that the critics did not mince their words about the Beatles so if they have to criticize them they did it uh, and in some cases uh, they, they they were overreacting to to their records or to their you know releases Mm. Uh, for whatever reason, so a double album like that, I'm not really sure. Mm. A melodic kind of album, or maybe safer, as a Red Rose Speedway uh, in a single uh, configuration is uh, pleased more critics and yeah. fans. And it's kind of hard to follow Wildlife, which didn't do as well as I'm sure Paul. And the band would have liked and i'm sure the record company wasn't that happy with the sales of wildlife to follow that up with a double album but i also remember uh from the mccarty legacy hearing that the record company didn't want denny lane songs they wanted it to be all paul mm. so just yeah your, it is in your opinion do you think that paul really made a concerted effort to push wings as a band because the double album you've got denny lane songs you've got linda <laughs> you know mm -hmm. at the same time the front cover is just paul uh, i mean but you know uh, a personality uh like uh paul mccartney or john lennon i mean it's very hard uh, even though you have a, a a great band with you to really consider the, the other members equals. I mean, John did did a different path. Uh, you know, Plastic on a Band, uh, 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 conceptual kind mm. of group, and that was it. And he and he did uh, a group uh, record with some time in New York City. You know, right. uh, and his and and the backing band. You know, the Elephant's Memory. Uh, you know. In the end, uh, it's hard to tell, but who cares about these musicians? I mean, they were great musicians, but in the end, it's John Lennon. In the end, it's Paul McCartney. I mean, it's very hard to, you know, uh, to stand up, 
to these personalities because they are the best in the world, because they are the, 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 the most incredible songwriters and artists of all time. And so you can, you can back up them. You can help them uh, doing their music and maybe suggesting arrangements and stuff. But, you know, the core is the songwriting. And, and Paul, anyway, did, I think, 90, if not 95% of the songwriting of Wings. Mm -hmm. And if there's no songwriting, there's no live shows, there's no albums, there's, there's nothing. Then you can work on, on arrangements. You can, you can suggest the ideas. There's harmonies. There's a lot of things that go when you are, have to record your music. Uh, but, you know, uh, the center of, of, of the music is the songwriting, is the song. And, and I have uh, repeated this many times, but I think it's important. For Paul, uh, the song is more important than the arrangement. So you have a group, uh, five members, uh, but with Wings it's different because it's not that you have a, a bass player, two guitars, keyboard and drums. Wings were really different. Paul plays everything. Paul plays piano. Paul plays guitar. Acoustic guitar, electric, does solo. And so it's it's a different kind of concept. If Paul thinks that the song doesn't need a solo, there's no solo. So that there's there's many in instances where Henry McCulloch or even Jimmy McCulloch were sitting they, they were sitting in, in the control room waiting for for Paul to finish the session. And that's it. You know, but that that's that's the music of Paul McCartney. Well, it's different. It's a little bit more complicated to me because there's so many ways you can look at what the concept of a band is. Hmm. Even if Paul wrote every single song and every single note, what the others contribute as musicians and in the arrangements of the songs could really help to shape the way that we hear it. And they could all make their own contributions. I'm just asking... Yes, I know that Paul is the, the leader of the group and the dominant member of the group. And there were times when he knew exactly what he wanted with his songs. And there were times when he would ask for musicians to make contributions. And I've, I've heard from various members of Wings, like, like Denny Sywell, Lawrence Juber in particular, where they would they would try to put some uh, their own ideas into the songs and Paul would accept it. So it's, yeah. it's you know, Paul and backup musicians to me i'm asking if you really think paul was sincere in projecting wings as a real band because not only did they mm. uh like denny lane would have a certain number of songs certainly on london town um but in concert he would have his songs and i've said many times wings over america tour denny lane sang lead on five songs on the mm -hmm. show not just yeah maybe yeah. mcculloch got one song in in the show mm -hmm. and um and and they had various members of wings go and do interviews or be part of interviews as, as a five people. yeah so it's not like all the attention was centered on paul there were times when it was there were times mm -hmm. the whole band so because oh. of this through this entire sure. 70s do you think that paul really made a, a sincere effort that he really wanted wings to be noticed mm. Witness wings at the speed of sound. Every member. Got yeah. It. Uh, okay. It's it's um it's difficult to to answer because uh, we are not in Paul's mind. But my feeling is that uh, he was uh, sincere. It was he was pushing wings, uh, especially uh, when they started. So I think it was very important for him to have a band and feeling part of a band. When they started with the with the university tour, that was a key moment. Mm -hmm. So for him, it was very important to 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 feel part of a band. Uh, and I think this phase uh, lasted exactly until uh, Red Rose Speedway. And I think uh, uh, after that, we know that two members left, and so he came back to you know even. Even uh, Red Rose Speedway is Paul McCartney and Wings, right? But then, but then after Ben on the Run became successful, and, Venus yeah. Mars was just 
wings. Exactly. And then, and then uh, the second phase, the second phase is uh, sure, uh, at least until, until the wings of America, uh, I think it pushed wings uh, very much. After that, there was a different phase again. Uh, then he contributed more. Uh, but I think Paul from 1977 was uh, feeling, uh, I don't know if, if tired, a bit tired, but it, for sure it was in a different phase. I think the, you know, the peak of his success was Wings of America Tour. Where it's undeniable. And so after that, uh, he entered a different phase. He tried to, he tried to, you know, rebuild Wings with uh, with Steve Holly and Lawrence Juber. and I I just recently read a couple of interviews of Paul and someone asked, uh, "Is this the best lineup of Wings?" And he says something like, "Well, sort of." So it was, uh, it was sincere or not? I don't know, but I mean, it it did his best. And uh, as I told you, I was not aware of Wings when I was in my. Uh, and I was 13, 14 years old, but definitely Wings was were very popular in the 70s as a band. And not only, I, I, I did not live at this period directly, but you can tell me. So I'm not denying they were contributing a lot and Paul was sincere, maybe not uh, cons consistently during uh, the whole uh, uh, decade, that's uh, that's my feeling. Different phases, uh, different need needs also for Paul. Right. So you and I have different experiences because I'm ten years older than you, and I also remember in the '70s very well. And I've said this many times on this channel and in my podcast, rock radio stations in the '70s playing album cuts from wings and not just paul songs mm -hmm. time to hide <laughs> you know they played cook of the house in new york yeah. they played um the note you never wrote they played they played white old junko in medicine jar it wasn't just paul all the time <laughs> during that period so it's just my memories of it all so no, i don't know yeah i know how um, you know, Paul was was played on the radio here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, ju just to close this point, I think uh, we are coming um, in, into a period where wings are more uh, recognized as as a brand, and I think also Paul and one and clapping the recent one and clapping is proof of this. Mm -hmm. uh, wants to push his wings identity to some extent because he knows that you know time passes and uh it's part of his legacy wings and so it's time for him also to claim let me say there was another very successful decade with uh with his material and with this with this band which had many different lineups but you know it was it was an incredibly successful decade sure Discuss, if you will, this is right before Ben on the Run, the importance of Live and Let Die. I mean, now it's recognized as a classic. And mm. I know it's hard for some people to believe, but sometimes when a record's first released it do and it does well, you have no idea 10 years later or 50 years later whether it's still going to be considered a great song or mm -hmm. a classic. And it still is. And it's always been a highlight of Paul's live shows. Yeah. Why is that song so important? Did it really lead to this incredible buildup into Band on the Run? Well, it's it's a key song for for many reasons. I mean, uh, first uh, known <laughs> at the time collaboration with George Martin, mm -hmm. which uh, was was uh, was fundamental to put together the song for the arrangement and stuff. You know, the collaboration really worked well because the piece was you know intended for soundtrack that's the first reason then you know being a soundtrack to to a james bond movie you know the popularity of of james bond uh, was was incredible i think 
I, when I was a kid, probably starting around 1977, 78, with my parents, we went to the cinema to see James Bond. And for me, James Bond was Roger Moore because mm -hmm. I didn't see Sean Connery. Well, for my parents, it was a bit different. But anyway, it, it was very popular. And the song itself is, uh, uh, is fantastic. I mean, it's built really, really in a, in a wise uh, way, you know, different parts put together. And it was very successful at the time as well. You know, number two in the charts in the U.S., million seller. Uh, nomination for the Academy Award. I know. I mean, it was very successful even at the time. And I think uh, then over over the decades, over the years, we all know that uh, uh, Paul started to do the song um, in concert in the in the nineties, and there was the the big uh, cover by the Guns N' Roses, which right. was successful as well. So I mean, uh, it has a good uh, a good track of success since way back. Not only not only recently or uh, after after Paul went uh, went on the road again with the Paul McCartney World Tour, he was very successful at the time, and the critics were were very were very good at the time. Uh, I think that someone uh, pointed out that uh, uh, it it worked as a soundtrack, maybe a little bit less as a song. I think uh, it's a combination of the two things because it's not easy to put together different uh, things and make it work. And mm -hmm. I think it's three minutes and we got basically four different parts. <laughs> you got a verse, you got a, the, 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 the chorus, the, the riff and the middle by Linda, mm. all in three minutes. Right. You know, huh? It's <laughs> I love I love it. It really is a masterpiece. And just from what I remember as a teenager listening to that with with the headphones on at the time, I was blown away by the whole sound of it and loving the song, too, obviously. Well, I, I can I can tell you that uh, I I have tried to learn the, the, the song on the piano yeah. um, the, the previous years, some some years ago. And if you go through all the parts. Uh, you can really understand the genius of this man because it's uh, you know there, there's a there's an incredible number of uh, of things that you can go through. Like you can discover really a lot of nuances, and you can improve really uh, your your piano playing only by doing this song properly. Okay, I I agree with you totally. Um... Something I didn't know that you mentioned here in your book was uh, there was an actual group called The Wings, mm. which was led by Spud and Nat Ban. Mm -hmm. It had been founded around 1970 in Lagos. Although yeah. I can't see how that would have caused a problem because there's, there's plenty of instances where you've got two different bands in the world with the same name. Yeah, it seemed to me curious that uh, I found uh, a group called The Wings and from Lagos. Which, I mean, it's uh, it's very important in in Paul McCartney's history for band on the run. So, right. I, I thought it was a, it was a nice detail to add. Definitely, um, you say part of why Paul drums on Band on the Run was because he heard Stevie Wonder play drums on his mm -hmm. record, and. Um, Paul said he didn't want to break in an African drummer because it would have taken hours to tell him exactly what I wanted. Mm. So one thing I'm curious about, and we all know that Ginger Baker wanted Paul to record Ben on the Run in his studio. Mm -hmm. he ended up recording only one of the songs in his studio, Picasso's Last Words, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, why, didn't, <laughs> why didn't he ask Ginger Baker to do drumming? I mean, they were friends. Well, because because I think Ginger is a well was a, a, an incredible drummer, obviously, but it's it, it's not uh, the the kind of drumming Paul needed for his songs. That that's the only reason I think uh, 
he, he could steal the show as well a bit. And when it when it you know if you go out with a, with with an album and you know that Ginger Baker is drumming, then it steals the show a bit, you know. Uh-huh. And, and and I think Paul Paul conceives his songs in a in a specific way, so uh, there's no need uh, for you know having the the most incredible skills on drums on guitar and stuff uh sometimes there is a some you know virtuosity uh, in the instrumental backing but basically he likes to keep it straight and uh and i think band on the run is proof that you can do a great album uh even without a drummer <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Well, all the parts that that Paul did play really fit very well, although we still don't know. You know, Denny Sywell said that, you know, they did make uh, demos or they rehearsed and Paul kind of copied what Denny was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I have reported this this, uh, sentence by by Denny because we don't know. We don't have um, those... um, famous uh, reels uh, from the Scotland rehearsals. So we don't know which kind of parts uh, Denny uh, played. It's very possible that Paul played exactly what was uh, there. Uh, but, you know, you, you, got to, you got to be very confident anyway to, to sit uh, and drum uh, on your own songs in a in a in a good way, and I think he did uh, he did a great job. Eh? Well, he's got a great feel for his own songs. Um, and one thing that I found interesting was the um, on the song Helen Wheels, it's not just Paul. Mm-hmm. Drums, you say Denny Lane was on the bass drum, and Paul played the snare and the cymbals. <clears throat> and Paul has said that he has trouble doing a shuffle. Mm-hmm. Tempo. But you're so used to seeing the video where Paul's behind the drum kit, so you think he's probably doing everything. And it makes yeah. me wonder about, because there is a somewhat of a controversy with Dear Prudence mm. uh, in that it does say in the White Album um, archival box set that Paul is the drummer on it. And there's some kind of complicated stuff that's that's heard towards the end of it. And to me, it sounds like Ringo. And I don't want to argue with you know, uh, Whoever did the notes, the the notes for the the um, yeah, album. but uh, if that's true and Paul's having difficulty with Helen Wheels playing everything, you know it makes me wonder about that. And that's and that's the same uh, for um, Old Brown Shoe, which that there's a controversy about the drumming on Old Brown Shoe because it said Ringo Paul something like that, and right. and it's and it's a it's a kind of shuffle. I think it's it's quite complicated. So I wanted to dedicate some attention to this aspect in my book. You know, so pause drumming and analyzing uh, in detail his parts. And as you mentioned, uh, Denny helped Paul on Helen Wills. Mm. We got a very, very simple part on Picasso's last words and Ginger and others. Uh, are are you know yeah um, playing shakers or something like that? Yeah. There's Remy Kabaka on Bluebird, and we don't really know which instrument he plays. Uh, if it's only percussion or drums, could be anything. Uh, if you listen carefully, also to well Mamunia, there's no drums. There's Denny on congas, and there's a roadie on bass drum. So, you know, uh, there's, there's a very limited use of symbols in the songs, except for maybe jet. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting because I think uh, he worked out his parts because he knows he's not the best drummer. Uh, he has said that. And he's, he's got technical limitations, but, you know, he's capable to to uh, to have his sound and to you know to use drums 
uh, within the song uh, in the best way. So I think it was interesting to analyze this aspect as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I found this one uh, quote from Jeff Emmerich uh, in your book to be interesting, since he engineered Ben on the Run, um, that he thought that the technical limitations of the studio had a positive impact on the sound. Mm. He said, sometimes it's a plus to be away from the studio and that studio sound. Sometimes those little rooms can give a recording a special character. He's referring to the studios in Lagos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the environment is uh, in music is uh, is very important. So they perfectly know what to expect in uh, Abbey Road, mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden you are in uh, in Lagos, very very far away from home. Uh, different conditions, different weather, different studio, different equipment, problems, issues. And and that's part of the fun, uh, anyway. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they just have to build, uh, you know, the the screens for the boots and stuff. So, you know, unexpected. Uh, it's it's kind of surprising, Ken, to me, that uh, uh, Jeff uh, discovered that they can listen only to four tracks simultaneously because right. they didn't check beforehand maybe they they just thought well it's an emi studio so there's a standard all over the world so i'm not i'm not worried and yeah. then they discovered it was it was not the case but i mean then it's a challenge and uh this uh this can help uh or contribute to you know, to a particular atmosphere or to to coming up with uh, with new ideas and, and stuff. That's the thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, if the studio is not equipped to have what you're used to having, it forces you to be more creative with the mm. limited amount that you have. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like uh, I mean, uh, when I started playing and recording myself, I had a four-track machine. I had a four track machine. Now I get logic and I got a, an unlimited kind of uh, number of tracks mm. if, that I can use. At the time I got four tracks and I get to bounce uh, uh, doing the reduction for, for having more space. And maybe I could add maybe one or two or three tracks, but you lose quality. But at the time I, I, I spent a lot of, uh, a lot of hours thinking how I could, uh, you know, do, uh, could use these tracks mm -hmm. uh, in the best way because I knew that I, I, I could not waste space and tracks. Right. You know, it's, that's, it's, it's very similar. Yeah. And they think a lot more how to handle it, you know, whereas if you have unlimited tracks, you're kind of spoiled. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to say you get lazy because of that, but there is something to be said if you look back at what the Beatles had to deal with. Mm -hmm. so most of their recordings were only four tracks, and they had to do a lot of reduction and all that and try to figure out what goes on the remaining tracks once you do that. and You know, it's a lot more thinking involved. Mm -hmm. So also, um, I think some fans may not be aware of this, but because of the humidity that they had in Nigeria, the oxide fell off the tape and they had to transfer their, their four tracks to an eight track later. And they had to super compress the music to cover up mm. dropout. Well, it, th there's a quote by Tony Visconti who said, uh, yeah, because of the humidity in Nigeria, well, I'm not, 100 percent sure that uh, the tapes were oxidizing because of the humidity in nigeria uh because well in nigeria they had a uh, eight tracks and then you know it's a different kind of tape uh the only track that was recorded on 16 tracks is picasso's last words because at ginger baker studio was better equipped so who knows? Maybe they just had uh, 
uh, I don't know, the 16 track from uh, uh, containing uh, Picasso. And they took it in Lagos. Then they took it back in London. And it was that very tape that were, was oxidizing. But it's humid also in London. So who knows uh, where the humidity uh, comes from? Anyway, they had to do, they had to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, this this copy because it was the 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 music was at risk. So that's another that's another incredible thing. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Jeff Emerick, it was uh, very quick in understanding and 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 doing the safety copy. And yeah. Very compressed, yes, definitely very compressed. You can hear it. I think uh, uh, Jet itself is very compressed. But anyway, it, it works. It works. It gives the the, the song a, a unique sound to it. Yeah. I didn't really think about until having this information in front of me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you cannot notice it. Yeah. Uh, just your personal feelings about the the story that Paul has told about his uh, cassette tape being stolen of demos, and it just seems unlikely to me that someone like Paul, who, from what I understand, is obsessed with archiving everything that he does, that he didn't have the recordings in his own private studio or mm. at or at EMI, um, and even then. Isn't it true that when he was robbed, they had already recorded the songs in Lagos? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he had to remember them all over again. He already recorded them. Yeah. I mean, he, I, I thought it was very uh, interesting and also for uh, all the readers and all the fans, because n no one ever did this, to go through uh, the the many of uh, Paul's statement about this event of the robbery. And so how we built this narrative over the decades, and it's very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not spoiling the content of the book, but you know, read it and, and go through all the statements and you can see a certain progression in Paul's narrative. So what I can tell you, Ken, is that uh, um, I can't remember because when you have a, when you read a lot of books on the Beatles, then sometimes you scroll and uh, I don't know you you read it very quickly. Sometimes you then you can reread it. Then you forget what you have read. I am reading a language which is not my native language because I read in English since way back, but it's still not my native language, you know. So it's a different kind of process when you when you read it. So at some point I reread maybe for the uh, one thousand time uh, the, the same uh, quote, and it said uh, we were robbed after a couple of weeks, and so I said, hmm, let me let me uh, uh, you know think about it because I knew that uh, the Lagos session lasted three weeks so uh, i said well if he's saying that he was robbed after two weeks uh, only one week remains for recordings and mm -hmm. i knew all the narrative of paul that said i got to remember the songs and stuff so i said that's something strange then um uh, uh, alan cousin and adrian sinclair had, had done a Yes. Fantastic job of putting together the sequence of the events, and there's a, a there's an interesting document in the book that Adrian uh, 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 gave permission to me to include in the book, which is an internal memo of MPL, and we got the date of the robbery. So, yeah, and all the songs were recorded already. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, but because band on the run and the robbery and stuff, it's such a good story uh, in terms of narrative. I mean, uh, then after a while, you uh, you start remembering it 
in a different way. It was a shocking event because being robbed in Lagos, uh, can you imagine Ken being uh, robbed uh, in the middle of the night? Uh, I mean, I mean in, it's an evening, you are out, you, you don't know what's going to happen. You got your music with you, you are robbed of your music anyway. And music is important for Paul. He's a musician, he's a composer and stuff. Like his babies, I don't know. You know, so it's it's shocking. And then the day after he fainted. So I I I I think this contributed to to a, a certain amount of stress for him. So I mean, after after time passes, then you start to remember things uh, in a different way. Maybe you want to remember it in a different way. Mm. It's a, it's a psychological process that is interesting. Uh, we we can we can think. Uh, that uh, he made up this uh, thing consciously, or we think, or we can think there's a psychological process behind it, which is more complex. And I think I'm in, <laughs> I don't know, I'm in the middle. Uh, could be both things, and but anyway, it's interesting because uh, someone in 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 some other interviews I've done. Uh, um, in the in the previous weeks, told me something like, "Well, it's a, it's a cinematic thing." I mean, and I have mentioned this in the book. It's a cinematic uh, kind of album, "Band on the Run." But Paul made a, a film about a robbery, and it's give my regards to Broad Street. Mm. You know, he made a film about it, so it's the, it's an event that it's it's deep down uh, somewhere. Uh, in his in his mind, yeah, interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I just think that the way you tell a story, the way you tell the narrative, there are ways to make it far more interesting. Yeah. Um, and there's well, always, I, there's always some truth in what Paul is saying. It's just he probably elaborated a, a, a bit too much in telling the story. No, I I agree with you. The the um... The doubt I have is that uh, it was a shocking event. Right. So we got to consider this. Um, so if he, he made up something and it's an innocuous uh, kind of event, I'll be 100% with you. Uh, in this case, I'm not 100% sure because it was shocking. So there's part of your mind that... Uh, tries or 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 you know wants to forget uh some things that happened and wants to re-elaborate what happened because it's not that heavy you know okay yeah i think that there are times when paul wants to remember things a certain way mm -hmm. once he convinced himself that it had happened a certain way then he keeps repeating it and he starts to believe it yeah yeah definitely Definitely. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about Hell and Wheels, because as we all know, it was released as a, as a single here in the U.S. and it became part of the album Bad on the Run, whereas Paul didn't want it to be on Bad on the Run in the first place. And the U.K. version didn't have Hell and Wheels on there. What I find interesting is that, you know, obviously in Paul's mind, he thinks... A, so many songs are strictly singles that don't belong on albums, going back to the Beatle years. But he did record Helen Wheels in Lagos. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you would think that that tie in right there with all the other music that he recorded in Lagos, even though there were some songs that were just recorded at EMI. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you suppose that was? And also, it is true that Paul, in fact, didn't want any singles released from then mm. on the run initially. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we got to rely on on what uh, people told us, and people in this case is Paul, and um, uh, and the promoter uh, at at Curry. Capital, Al Curry. Yeah. So we have these two these two people telling us uh, how it went, and Al was wrong in a, in a couple of uh, of his memories. Mm -hmm. uh, he says that uh, Helen Wills was 
uh, added to the US edition of Banner Run because it was a su success. It was not true because it was impossible to know that uh, it was a success uh, because the album was, I mean, uh, was was produced and was released uh, shortly after the single. So it, it took time for Helen Woods to go up in the charts. Mm -hmm. So it, they could not know. Uh, yeah, it went Paul to, went to number ten in the U.S. That's that's yeah respectable. Yeah, yeah, I, I, definitely. I don't know why Paul uh, wanted to put out uh, Helen Wills soon as a single. For sure, they they mix it and prepare it uh, uh, just just uh, after they went back in London to London. So they mix it immediately and do it uh, and, and and do it as a single. Uh, well, for some reason, he, he thought it was a, uh, it was a, uh, a good single material, mm. and he did it. And probably they need a single. They needed a single, because "Live and Let Die" was out in June, and uh, and Alan Wills was out in October. Uh, so at the time, you know, about four months uh, between one single and another, and something. So I think the Maybe EMI or Capital uh, pushed for a single. Uh, it was and it was okay. Then I mean, for me, being from Italy and so Europe, for me, Band on the Run is without Helen Wills uh, because I'm accustomed to to the nine songs. So yeah, I, I then for you probably it's it's completely different experience because. You had Alan Wills on the album, so for you it's ten tracks, and for me it's nine. So it's a matter of uh, experiencing it in a different way. Uh, personally, I think Alan Wills is not that in line with the rest of the material. It's it's a bit different, anyway. Uh, but I'm biased also because I have always. Uh, listen to Banner Run without Helen Wills. So there's a bias and there's a personal feeling which, that the song is a bit different. But then it fits because of the reference to Sailor Sam, which oh, true. it's, it's, it's a, you know, a common, something in common with, with the title track. So it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting anyway. It's a solid rocker, just like Jet is. You know, so I don't I don't see why it didn't belong. And I'm also thinking, you know, going back to the Beatle years, there were plenty of Beatles albums because since they always thought of singles and albums as separate entities, there were classic Beatle albums that didn't have singles released from it at all from Sgt. Pepper. The White Album at the time didn't have a single. Uh, Rubber Soul didn't have a single. Um and maybe he was thinking Ben on the Run would be another album that didn't have any singles. And part well, of it, for its success was was having two hits, and in the case of the U.S., three hits. Yeah, it's it's a it's a bit strange because then uh, we know that Ben on the Run and Jet were singles. So for us, is single material one hundred percent. Yeah. And um, for Paul, it was different. Well, if you think about Jet, it's kind of a natural single. If you think about Band on the Run as a song, it's a bit more complicated. They did an edit to mm. put it out as a single, uh, at least for radios and or a promo, uh, because it's five minutes and uh, and it's a you know very structured uh, kind of song. Well, you can tell me, well, it's not that different from Live and Let Die. Maybe it's a little bit. It's a bit different from Live and Let Die, but it's a kind of same idea, you know. Uh, but it's not an immediate uh, single. Uh, although the third part of the song is so catchy. Mm -hmm. The other two parts is, well, it's, it's, it's a different feel, it's a different style. Then in the end, works uh, perfectly. Uh, you know, and in, in this case, marketing did... Uh, did an incredible job because you know Band on the Run as a single sold two million copies in the US. It's 
it's outstanding. Well, the the great part about watching the success of Ben on the run with the singles is that each successive single did better than the previous one. So you had Tail and Wheels at 10, Jet at 7, Ben on the run hit number one. And that kept Ben on the run high up on the charts, and it was number one three separate times. It dropped mm-hmm. out, went back, dropped out again, went back, and it helped to to give the album the longevity of being yeah. for over two years. Yeah, and I, I think in, in the end, uh, uh, well, probably the rules of the marketing uh, in the 70s were a bit different compared to uh, to the 60s. And so they, they, they knew they knew perfectly what they were doing uh, at Capitol and, 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 and they were right and they were right. Starting to get into a period when albums could have three singles. So. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about Mrs. Vanderbilt, a few things about it. Mm-hmm. This is an interesting observation that you made. The sax part that Howie Casey plays in the refrain resembles the melody of Mine for Me, mm-hmm. which Paul wrote for Rod Stewart. And I'm hearing that now. <laughs> because yeah. I mean, part. when Paul stated it, uh, there's a bit... Of uh, of another song, I, I'm not sure if he mentioned mine for me or something, but no, I think he mentioned this, uh, and so I I, uh, I wanted to to really understand which part was it, and it's a and it's a sax solo part. Uh huh. It's interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I'm hearing, and it, it works, and it works perfectly. Yeah, it's the one, the part that goes da 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 da. da. Yeah. That's that is a bit like mine for me. That's yeah, a, a little bit adapted, but the melody is there. Yeah. Also, and I think this was the McCartney legacy too. The opening lines down in the jungle, living in a tent. She don't use money. She don't pay rent. She don't even know the time, but she don't mind. That's an adaptation of down in the jungle, living in a tent, better than a prefab, no rent. It's a catchphrase made famous by comedian and presenter mm-hmm. Chester. In his BBC radio show, Stand Easy, 1946. Yeah. No, I, that up, you know? It's a, uh, it's an interesting track, this uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt, because it's filled with these uh, references uh, to, to comedians and stuff. There's a, there's a, there's a laughter, <laughs> even. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things linked uh, to, to the, to Paul's passion for, you know, uh, comedy and comedians. It's it's interesting uh, way to exploit this uh, this passion. Hmm. Okay. It's just interesting. Makes you you know nowadays you can just go right to YouTube and listen to these songs. Speaking of which, <laughs> though this has nothing <laughs> to do with Ben on the Run, uh, Water Spout. Hmm. I know it's a London Town track and all. Um. You said the tribal rhythm filled with percussion recalls uh, fellow Ransom Cooties, Why Black Men Day Suffer. Mm. The percussion uh, pattern, it's uh, very similar. So I just yeah. went to YouTube and then checked that out. I didn't really hear what you were hearing, but it's just interesting. Did you automatically think that when you heard Water Spout? No, yeah. I mean, I, I, when, I, when I heard this song by Fella, yeah, I said, well, it reminds me something, and uh, and I, I immediately thought of Water Spout, and Paul has mentioned this song uh, of Fella being uh, uh, his favorite and stuff, and I think the pattern, the the, the just the, the initial percussion drum pattern of this song is very similar to Water Spout, so that's what I hear, but I think it's. It's very possible. I'll try to listen more with that in mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, no words. You said the original version was two minutes longer. Did you hear the this version? I'm trying to think if it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, they they recorded in Lagos uh, with an extended uh, solo. It's kind of rough, sketched, final part. You know, with more guitars at the end, okay. and it was only instrumental, 
the the vo all the vocals were added after uh well i think it's it's it was kind of uh, uh improvised at the end so i think they decided in the end to to cut it and and to to edit to 2 minutes 40 or something like that yeah right. but it was it was longer yeah i love the way the song ends on the album i just think that that the uh guitar solos are kind of too short i want them to go on mm. a little now you also say or you hypothesize here um the line it's only me i love you is from what john said to to paul and paul's brought this up sometimes if he's john slagging off paul he would bring down the the granny glasses and he would say it's only me paul it's only me you know do you know this for a fact did paul actually say that's why he put that line in there or is that just your no i mean it, it it's a there's a coincidence uh because if you if you just uh take this line in the song it's only me i love you it's kind of un unrelated or on stuff it, it could be anything right and it's it seems to me uh more than a coincidence that this were uh only uh, also uh, John's word words to him, so I think he, he always finds ways to put uh, something from uh, his uh, recollections of John in the songs, and this is a hidden way, maybe, to put something from uh, from uh, the days with John and something very emotional and very meaningful for him even at the time so i think it's very possible yeah and paul has even admitted with the song ben on the run the line if i ever get out of here mm -hmm. from something george harrison would say yeah. at apple meetings when he was bored and he didn't want to spend time discussing business you know if i ever get out of here yeah it's it's interesting that you mentioned this because uh, he said it uh, quite uh, soon after the album was, was released. So I think the memory was fresh. And he said, well, that came from a remark George made during a, a business meeting. Right. And then uh, I think uh, some years after, I can't remember exactly when, someone asked to him, uh, uh, it is this, uh, because they read it in, in some books, and they asked again to Paul and said, I can't remember. I, I don't remember being related to George, but it's it makes sense. I mean, if you ask him after 40 years, uh, he, he could not remember. But in 1974, he said it, uh, he said that. And so we we, we can be sure that uh, he was referencing to to George. And it's it's I can hear George ma making this mark. <laughs> all right just a few more things uh bring it up mrs vanderbilt one more time it was actually released as a single in continental europe and in australia in january of 74 any idea why no i don't know uh i don't know why uh i think that probably it has to to do uh with with the fact that uh maybe marketing departments like to do different choices and uh, if they if they heard uh interesting material that uh they they think okay let's let's do something different in europe so mm -hmm. we will have maybe more exposure you know you you don't have the same single uh, all over uh and so you know you people uh hear different songs and so also i think also through this uh you can guarantee more exposure more successes maybe it has to do something with different tastes uh that uh, this marketing people think uh uh various countries have mm. you know anything could be uh someone can say okay this seems to me uh uh more in line with uh, this kind of audience. They are the specialists, so yeah, they thought something. It's just remarkable in, in a lot of ways because, 
you know, the story behind Mulligan Tire was that it was the the biggest hit in the UK at that time as a single, and it was a huge hit all over the world, except in the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they try to push that song? I guess it was kind of strange to push a single that had bagpipes on them. You know, a folk song with bagpipes. They probably thought it wouldn't do well here, and yet. The rest of the world, it sure did well. Mm. Once Upon a Long Ago was a big hit mm -hmm. in many countries, and yet it wasn't released here at all in the United States. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, you know. You know it's, uh, it's difficult to to understand. So, I mean, we, we, can, we can think about for months and not having an answer. And then maybe it's just a choice, or it's just because... Uh, uh, I don't know, marketing departments had got uh, some, uh, I know they were independent from each other uh, according to different territories, who knows. You know, it was a single also in Italy at the time. It was, I think it was quite successful. Um, I mean, it's quite catchy, so. Yeah, you know, top 10 in a lot of countries. Yeah. Anyway, um, one thing here about Country Dreamer, I didn't know that it was actually demoed. In the summer of 1970. Oh, yeah. Um, and that version is almost identical to the version that came out. Have you heard it? This yes. It's a, it's, a, it's a great version. I mean, it's a, it's a Paul, and, Paul and Linda. I think it's, a, it's coming from the Ram demos in 70, summer 70. Okay. It's, it's a, from that list. And it's, a, yeah, it's a perfect uh, rendition, even, even better than the backyard one so pure so straightforward i like it yeah great song since you mentioned the backyard <laughs> uh -huh. perfect segue there yeah what's your impression of uh one hand clapping real quick before we wrap things up the new release great uh release uh, uh that uh proves that uh, mpl and paul know what they're doing know what they're doing because they they perfectly know that it's time to dig in the archives and to offer something to wings fans and one and clapping is uh is the first bootleg i've ever owned hmm. you know it's the first bootleg i've ever owned i i bought this picture disc version that was called why should i complain pictures and it was a portion of one in clapping. And I think that for years, it was supposed to be from Nashville. Uh, it was supposed to be from the Nashville uh, period. Uh, and so, yeah, it was a kind of uh, going back in time also for me. Great release. Uh, my only, uh, I mean, concern is that the backyard is not included in the CD version or in the two LP standard version, but it's offered as a limited edition uh, seven inches, which is a nice item to have, which I immediately bought. Mm. Uh, and um, but I mean, the backyard is such a great thing; is such a gem, uh, which I, I I have loved. I would have loved to to see the backyard within within the the one and clapping in into the cd and the whole performance you know the backyard tapes could have existed just as a separate release all to itself yeah for something yeah, I mean, for, the cuff, you know for them for them uh, having three cd's could have been too much and i think if we just tag it at the end uh, on the second disc would have would have been perfect. Anyway, I enjoyed very much discovering uh, uh, new things with Paul at the piano doing tomorrow in that slow yeah. version that uh, Linda's dad always suggested to him, and it's a slow version of tomorrow. That's power cut, which is I I, I love this song. That's a uh, hint of let it be, let longer one in row. So. Nice, nice to have also new material. Sally G, acoustic. Sally G. That was nice. And that, that was nice. 
that's the version of Soily. Man, that kicks ass. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, but... yeah. They were still working on, on, on Soily at the time, you know, because it's very different. You know, the Wing Sober Maker uh, version, it's, it's, they worked on, on Soily a lot, even, even after that. Even but the it's interesting. versions of what they did live of Soily, the arrangement is different from what they did. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, he's released one hand clapping in jibs and drabs through the years, you know, on the mm -hmm. best archival box set, Venus and Mars box set. Um, that version of Live and Let Die was on mm -hmm. the in-laws soundtrack. Yeah. Maze was on the first McCartney album archival box set. Yeah. So, you know, but to have this other stuff and there's there's plenty more, apparently. <clears throat> you know, you mentioned Power Cut. Alan Cozen said on things we said today that that uh, he also does the other songs from mm -hmm. so why yeah. power cut and not, and not the others but well who knows maybe a, another anniversary uh, more material yeah <laughs> if we're still around we will see <laughs> do you think and well, I'll leave you with this one question that the reason he's putting out something like this or the underdub mixes of band on the run is just in case we're not getting archival box sets this is something to tie us over no so I, i'm have it or what what is your opinion on that um, um not necessarily uh they could uh coexist uh i would i would be very happy uh obviously to have uh the box set for uh, London Town and Back to the Egg in the archive collection format, because they deserve. They deserve to, to you know, finish this incredible work. And to finish the seventies, with these two albums in this format, uh, only only time will tell. Uh, but they could coexist, because you know, uh, if you do an archival thing. And then you have to put in two CDs only for one and clapping. Then it comes, well, it becomes uh, maybe a little bit too much. Maybe they do, don't want to offer, you know, five or six uh, CDs for, for release, even for an archive, because they got more material. They got all the photos, the books and stuff. And so they know that uh, a two CD standalone, uh, have uh, his market and uh, it's a way also to market Paul's music and his backlog uh, maybe in a in an easier way right you know you can you can send this to 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 stores while the archive collection are a little bit little bit more difficult uh, or they are limited in in quantities and uh, and so, but I mean, they can co coexist and let's see, cross, cross our fingers because I, I'm really eager to see uh, London Town and Back to the Egg as soon as possible. Almost everybody's saying that. I'd be happy for anything that he hasn't put out as a box set. I'd be happy for Press to Play. I'd be happy for Off the Ground, you know, <laughs> Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, you name it. Um yeah. Yeah, Murray Gardens to Broad Street, maybe a box set. Yeah, but well, but because and that's a concept behind uh, what we were saying at, at the beginning of my books dedicated to possibly to all uh, Paul McCartney's albums because his albums are uh, are all an event. You know, each Paul album is an event, right? And so they, they deserve to be analyzed and they deserve to be, uh, you know, discussed in, in depth. And that's why we're here. That's right. That's why the word podcasts were invented. Yeah. That's why the concept was so we can delve deep into all of these albums. Yeah. When you're dealing with a legend like Paul and the other Beatles, all their works need to be analyzed and assessed and reassessed over and over for future generations. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, uh, j just to just to to wrap up. I mean, uh, does my project is you know uh, 
music is ideas as you shown the first volume there will be volume two there will be volume three that blah 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 and that's uh and that's uh all the songs okay uh, the classic reference book divided in different volumes and then there's there's still room there's still room to dive in the single albums because there's so much material and uh, i thought well uh, if it's 170 pages for a book uh, in the end it's i don't know 20 albums so you can count the number of pages i will be adding to paul mccarthy's uh, music uh, history that's right. a lot of things and i think fans uh, will uh, appreciate uh, this kind of uh, dedication did you also say you were going to work on a book for the ringo album the Ringo songs, no, Ringo the the album Ringo. Weren't you going to do something? No, I will. I will. I will do something for Ringo, uh, but on all of his songs, not not specifically on Ringo. We will. We can. We can think about it because it's a it's a key album, and the uh, the series milestones is intended for historical albums, and Ringo definitely was. An historical album. So at some point, uh, it could be, it could be done. Uh, but probably, um, I will do something for Ringo songs. Also, in his case, because there are, there's a lot of material, it will, be, will will be divided in different volumes. But next next project can stay tuned because it's coming and it's a. Uh, my book on the solo Beatles that's coming, I think, if I'm lucky, in July. Otherwise, it will be out in September. Wow. And it's uh, on the solo Beatles. And it's the first part until John's death, because that makes sense to stop the first part uh, at John's death and then do a separate thing after his death until uh, these days. But it will be out soon and will be two parts narrative part and discography part so okay well you'll stay have tuned to... but it's coming and yeah. i think we need and i think we need a book on the solo beatles in the 70s because basically there's not uh, much out there uh since a while uh, and yeah. so it's time to to put up put out something Hey, I'm all for more solo Beatles. <laughs> I know, I know you're happy. So uh, wait a bit more and uh, you'll be happier. Luca's new book, Band on the Run, the story of a classic album. Make sure you pick it up. I'm going to give you folks the link for that off Amazon, as well as, as you know, music is ideas from Luca. And thank you so much for being with us again. It's always a joy. And Hopefully, if this new book is out in July, I'll see you very soon. <laughs> yes, Ken. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to, you know, to push the products as well as discussing uh, with you a lot of topics. Well, you're always welcome on the channel anytime you want. So, thank you, thank you Luca, for joining us. Thanks to all of you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you can, and we'll see you very soon. Mm-hmm. <laughs>